Note, this book contains descriptions of suicide, depression, self-harm, graphic sexual encounters, and harm befalling children. Also, there are repeated mentions of Beatles tunes, which will then stick in your head for days. Well, hey there, everyone. How has your week been? Mine's been okay. Yeah, it's been a week. Well, in all these videos I've been making about movies and books and all sorts of storytelling stuff, it has come to my attention that there are an awful lot of books and movies that are really quite popular and legendary and whatnot that I have not seen or read. There's one quite popular author who I only found out about online. There are a few of those. And I kept seeing his books in the bookstores and I thought, you know what, maybe I'll just pick one up. Well, I didn't end up doing that. I did end up getting it at the library. But in any case, I read it. It has been read. So now I have read a book by Haruki Murakami. It has happened, finally. I am part of the accepted crowd. I'm one of the cool kids now. Okay, maybe I'm not that cool, but I did read the book. Now, Haruki Murakami has written a decent number of books. So you might ask, which one did I start with? Well, <laughs> this might be interesting. I'm not sure. We'll find out. The book I started with happens to be Norwegian Wood. Norwegian Wood was originally written in 1987, which confused me because the copyright on here says 2000, but that must just be this edition. He started writing in 1979, so this is not one of his newer ones, but, you know, not an early, early one either. Okay, so first, a little bit about the author and his history. Haruki Murakami was born in January 1949 in Japan. His novels, essays, short stories, etc. have been bestsellers uh, both domestically and internationally. He has received numerous awards for his work, including the Gunzo Prize for New Writers, the World Fantasy Award, the Tanizaki Prize, Yomiuri Prize for Literature, the Frank O'Connor International Short Story Award, the Noma Literary Prize, the Franz Kafka Prize, the Kiriyama Prize for Fiction, the Goodreads Choice Awards for Best Fiction, the Jerusalem Prize, and the Princess of Asturias Awards. He did not publish his first novel, Hear the Wind Sing, until he was almost 30 years old. This was in 1979. Before writing, he owned a small jazz bar for seven years. He cites Raymond Chandler, Kurt Vonnegut, and Richard Brodigan as key inspirations to his work. And he also likes to run. For such a popular novel, Norwegian Wood took a long time to get a movie adaption made. There was finally one released in 2010 in Japan, starring Kenichi Matsuyama as Toru Watanabe, Rinku Kikuchi as Naoko, and Kiko Mizuhara as Midori. Okay, the pros are that this is a well-related story. It has a well-crafted narrative. It has memorable and evocative descriptive elements, don't I sound fancy? The women characters have the most going on, arguably, out of the entire cast, and they are well-drawn and uh, fleshed out. They have something going on for them. The book does not shy away from serious themes like depression and death and life and loss and love, many of those things we think of when we think of a literary novel. Then there's how these things intersect with each other and how one of those things can even lead to one of the others in interesting and unexpected ways and means. The cons. Where do I begin? <laughs> I'm sorry. To put it bluntly, I didn't care much for the story. Maybe I should have started with another book? It stated in the introduction and in the translator's notes that this is not an autobiographical novel, although it does contain some autobiographical elements. But here is where the issue lies. Okay, to begin just as a note type of thing, this book does contain uh, graphic descriptions of, shall we say, uh, grown-up relations that often happen in the bedroom. Um, I'm trying to skirt around it because I don't want to get, you know, in trouble with YouTube. So there's direct descriptions or third person recounting 
thereof. So if you're not down with that, you might want to just give this one a miss. Now, I can deal with those things, but uh, there was a decent amount of it that I actually found myself checking my watch, like, uh, okay, there's other stuff. Can we move on now? Our main character is also the first person narrator. That is also an acquired taste. It's something I can deal with. I write in first person quite often myself, um, but I didn't used to, and I didn't used to care for it. So I can understand, I can understand if that's not your cup of tea. The narrator's name is Toru Watanabe. Let's go through the plot a little bit. He is a college student who has uh, recently experienced the death of his best friend by suicide. He's processing the death, but not really processing it, as supposedly many young men in particular often do. Now, this former friend's girlfriend, Naoko, is also having definite difficulties processing that, and the two find a kind of solace in each other. However, her issues become too much for her to deal with in the real world, so she finds her way to this, um, not hospital, but like a peaceful retreat um, many miles away from pretty much everything. She contacts Watanabe, and he comes to visit her a couple of times, her and her roommate, an older woman in her oh, early 30s, oh, named Reiko. So he visits them a couple of times. He feels a sincere attachment to Naoko and figures that if she can get better and leave, then the two of them can build a life together. At the same time, he is approached by a young woman in his class named Midori. He does have feelings for her, but he tries to keep it on the down low and be like, we're just friends because I have feelings for Naoko. And seeing that through is very important to him. Now, after a great deal of time, Midori confesses her feelings for him and he does the same, but he says, you know what, let's, let's just back off on this because I still have this unresolved thing and still definite feelings for Naoko. So he's trying to do the honorable thing. We'll give him that. Naoko, meantime, has gotten worse and has to go into an actual mental hospital. This seems to work, and she uh, gets leave to go and visit Reiko, and they have a nice visit, but um, after a little while, she sneaks out and does uh, end her life in the woods. Watanabe is hit hard by her loss and kind of goes on a walkabout for a month or so. He gets to a point where he's able to come back to the real world himself. He cleans up, goes home, and is visited by Reiko, who has decided to leave the sanctuary herself. They find closure about Naoko, and she also leaves to start her new life. He then contacts Midori, deciding that he's finally ready to move on with his life, and is hit by the sudden realization that he has no idea how to do this. Or at least that's what I took from the slightly ambiguous ending. I'm sure many people just you know, got the ending right away, but I, unless it's kind of clear, I don't always get what's going on. Okay, now, the issues I had with this book. Okay, let's start with the lead character with Watanabe. He doesn't seem to have a lot going for him, um, at least a lot that really makes him interesting, and I think a lot of that has to deal with his non-processing of his emotions. He's a highly reactive character. We don't get a lot of clue about his likes, interests, hopes, and dreams, if only because he doesn't have a lot of clue about that himself. And that's fine, but at the same time, we don't sense any conflict, any urgency. There's not much besides the apathy and ennui that pervades his life. So the book is written, interestingly enough, that you get why he's that way. And you're not bored by it, necessarily. <laughs> But if it wasn't for everything else that happens in the book, you probably wouldn't be sticking around. And he's not even too terribly introspective about why he is that way. Now that notwithstanding, what really got me is that all these women characters, fascinating, interesting people in their own right, somehow they find him fascinating and they all fall into bed with him at some point or another, or at least they get close to the act, as it were. I mean, really? Now again, the author's careful to say that this isn't bi autobiographical, and I'm sure it's not. However, whenever a male author writes a story like this, a male, typically a male cisgender uh, heterosexual author, and there are lots of encounters with beautiful women, and um, 
it's just easy to be skeptical that perhaps there isn't a little bit of wishful thinking going on here. Especially when these women who presumably have had experience are just really enthusiastic about being with him and he's the best they've ever had and it's, it's that sort of enthusiasm and you're going, really? And also as is so often the point, and also as so often happens, um, apparently that's all they needed to get on with their lives. It doesn't work for him, but you know, it works for them. So he's magic or something, I guess. Now all that said, <laughs> the main part that really put me off and made me almost want to stop reading, except I still wanted to finish the whole thing because I'm making a YouTube video, dedication. There is a scene with one of the women and someone else. It is what could be termed a lesbian intimate bedroom scene. Now, the fact is it is not a lesbian intimate bedroom scene because that implies a consensual relationship between two consenting adults. And this was not. This was a scene between a grown woman and a 13 year old girl. And supposedly there was coercion and the 13 year old supposed to be a bad seed or whatever, but no, no, yuck, no. The other thing about that scene is it is relayed in detail. The older woman is relating the story from her past and she doesn't hold back. She's, she's getting it all out. However, the author could have held back and he didn't. He made that choice. And when you read something like that, it's like it says a whole lot of some things about the author. Why? Why did you make that choice? Why did you think that was the right choice to make? Yes, it's supposed to be off-putting, and that is certainly what happened, but it's not supposed to be off-putting to the point where your readers want to stop reading. It would have been so simple to relay the scene in half the time half, even more than half, than half the detail. And it still would have gotten the point across and it still would have worked. But the author made that choice to put all that in there. And it's just, it's gross. It, it's really, no, it's not something I, I, oh God. So to wrap it up, no, my uh, foray into Murakami did not go well. Now, I will point out there are many instances of um, largely cisgender, hetero male authors uh, putting absolutely horrific things in their novels and being hailed as great voices of literature. So, you know, I'm not, I'm not coming down on just him. <laughs> this is written in 1987. And being a child of the 80s, I have consumed a lot of media from that era. And there are definitely plenty of things that didn't age well. So I would hope his later books didn't do anything like this. As stated, this is already not a typical representation of Murakami's books. And I wish I had known that going in. I would have chosen something else in the first place. But is that true or no? Murakami fans out there, um, did his other, are his other books out there like this? Or did he kind of... I don't know if learn the lesson is the right term, but did he perhaps mature in his writing and realize that he didn't need to do something like that to draw on readers? Yeah, basically, I think that's it. Are his other books different enough and, shall we say, better enough uh, in that way that I might want to give him another try? Basically, what are your thoughts on this one? Uh, anyway, overall, these are just my thoughts and opinion is just that I have one just like everyone else. So you don't have to listen to me. Um, just if you're going to read this book, you might want to know these things going in. Okay, so yes, uh, thoughts, 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 please put them in the comments down below. I'm anxious to hear from you. And I will see you next week when I will be reading more books, seeing more movies, all that sort of etc. I've really got to think of a better way to end these videos. And Maybe I'll come up with that by next week. Who knows? In any case, I will see you then, and I hope you have a good week. Bye.